it's not necessarily a good thing, but yesterday as I was going over my notes for this evening, I decided to change my sermon. <laughs> and uh, uh, that means that the last psalm may not necessarily tie in with the theme, although it does in some ways, but I didn't want to change uh, the psalm for the sake of those who were raising the singing and doing the, the board. But I want us to read from John 10, um, the passage in which Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And then later on, we're going to read Psalm 23. Uh, a number of weeks ago, I was asked to preach at uh, Dramara. They were having a mission, and there were different men asked to preach each night, and I was given the responsibility of kicking things off on the Monday night. Uh, they gave the preachers the text that they had to preach on. You couldn't just pull out an old sermon and preach on it. So they gave me Psalm 23, and I quickly went through my files and discovered I had never in all my years as a minister preached in Psalm 23. I couldn't believe it. Uh, and that being the case, I sat down and wrote, uh, put together a psalm, a sermon on the psalm, and I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to uh, share it with you this evening. So that's what we're going to be thinking about. So for that reason, obviously, we're going to read John chapter 10. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out, all his own, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is the hard hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hard hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So reads God's word, and we trust he'll bless us as we, in a few moments, will come to study it together. Before we do that, let's take up our Psalters again and let us sing praise from Psalm 130b. Psalm 130b. Psalm that speaks about calling out to the Lord from the depths. And even in the 23rd Psalm, there's that idea of being in uh, the valley of the shadow and uh, calling out to and knowing uh, God's presence with us. Lord, from the depths to thee I cried, my voice, Lord, do thou hear. Unto my supplications voice, give an attentive ear. Lord, who shall stand if thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquity? And of course, the answer to that is that none of us would stand. None of us can justify ourselves before God. And yet the wonderful truth that follows is one in which we take great comfort 
and great delight. But yet, with thee, forgiveness is. That's a great truth. God is a forgiving God. But it also says that feared thou mayest be. Although we're forgiven, we're nevertheless to have a deep reverence for God. And we cannot look upon sin nor upon God lightly. We sing these five stanzas to the tune uh, Humility number 100. And we stand as we sing praise and remain standing for prayer. Let's pray together. (coughs) Father, we come to study your word. And even though it's a passage that is familiar to us, nevertheless, we realize, Lord, in order to understand it, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So grant that help, Lord, to preacher and hearer alike. And may what we learn prove to be of spiritual benefit to us. And may it get into our lives And may it make us the people that we're intended to be by your grace. And may it bring glory to the name of our God. We ask these things through Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Whenever I was growing up in Belfast, there was a man who lived just across the road from us. Uh, His name was Mr. McVeigh, uh, Carlyle McVeigh, you called him. And Mr. McVeigh was a wonder to us children who lived in the street because he was a man who had 12 fingers. Uh, He was born like that. He had six fingers in one hand and six fingers on the other hand. Uh, Two at where his thumb was. it must have been great for him when he was a child at school doing maths. He had a big advantage over the other kids. You could only count up to 10, and he could count up uh, to 12. Uh, there are some really weird things that happen 
uh, whenever people and animals are born. Uh, we have seen, for example, Siamese twins joined at the head and things like that. Uh, some really weird animals have been born over the years. Uh, for the farmers here, I wonder, did you know that there have been a number of two-headed cows that have been born? And two-headed pigs and two-headed turtles. That condition is known as polycephaly or polycephaly, whatever way the sea is pronounced, I'm not sure. And then there's been some animals that have been born with three or with five or six feet. Uh, dogs and cats born with multiple limbs. That's called polymelia. And then there have been some animals born with three eyes. A Holstein Frisian Jersey cow in India, born with three eyes. Another one born just across the water in Wales with three eyes. And there have been sheep, and this is the time of lambing of course, sheep born with three eyes. We're going to look at a sheep tonight in Psalm 23. Turn to that psalm with me and I'll read through it and then I'll say a little bit about it before we go into the study of it. So Psalm 23, I mean, you don't need to look it up. You all know it and probably could quote it word for word. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That 23rd Psalm was written, as you know, by King David. And in the early part of his life, David was a shepherd. And he writes this psalm from the perspective of the sheep. So David sees himself as a sheep who is looked after and cared for by a shepherd. Not just any shepherd, but a very experienced, a very skilled, a very loving, a very caring shepherd. A shepherd who knows his sheep intimately and who is extremely diligent in ensuring that he meets all their needs. Now you've read this psalm many times, you've sung it many, many times. Have you ever noticed that in this psalm there's a three-eyed sheep? We're going to look at the sheep's three eyes tonight. You said, what are you talking about? Three-eyed sheep? Yeah. Well, look at it. In verse 1, you've got the first eye. Not spelled E-Y-E, but spelled I. <laughs> I shall not want. The sheep's second eye is in verse 4. I shall fear no evil. And the third eye of the sheep is in verse 6. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So at least one thing, you're going to remember the title of this psalm, if you remember nothing else, the three-eyed sheep. And hopefully as we go through it, you'll see the wonderful truths that this psalm teaches about this sheep. The first eye, as I say, is in verse 1. And it's the eye of contentment. The eye of contentment. I shall not want. In order to get the grips with what David is saying in this psalm, you have to imagine that you, that I am the sheep for some of us here tonight, that's not too hard. Some of you work with sheep or you used to and you know what is needed in order for a sheep to be perfectly at ease and perfectly content. For others of us, maybe most of it's maybe a little bit more difficult. To David and to his original readers, it would have been very easy for them to understand exactly what David was getting at in this psalm. What was it that made this sheep say, I shall not want, or another translation, I shall lack nothing, 
or more colloquially, I am perfectly content, completely at ease. What a wonderful condition to be in. What was it that made this sheep perfectly content? Well, for one thing, the sheep was perfectly content because it belonged to a good shepherd. Philip Keller has written a lovely little book on the 23rd Psalm, and he speaks of a time that he owned a sheep farm in America. The sheep farm that was next to his farm was managed, not owned, was managed by a man who was a good-for-nothing layabout. He didn't look after the land. He didn't care for the sheep. Most of his flock were unhealthy, ill-nourished, scrawny, full of parasites. The fields in which his sheep lived were fields that had hardly any grass on them. And the grass that was on them was of a very poor quality. He didn't give a toss for the sheep. As far as he was concerned, it was just a job. He was just putting in his time. He was just earning a few dollars and he was doing a very poor job of sheep management. In complete contrast, Philip Keller owned his farm and owned his sheep. And he did everything that was in his power to care for them as best that he could. To him, every single sheep was precious. And although he had a large flock... He knew every single one of those sheep individually. And so precious were they that he says they each one became like extensions of his own family. And he says sometimes he saw the sheep in the farm next to him looking over and it almost seemed as if they were saying, I wish we belonged to that shepherd, that farmer. One of the reasons that the sheep in Psalm 23 could say, I shall not want was because those sheep belonged to a good shepherd. A shepherd who cared for them. And that brings us to the second reason. They were cared for by the good shepherd. This sheep in this psalm knew that because of who the shepherd was, because of the shepherd to whom they belonged, all their needs as a sheep, would be met. They didn't have to worry about a thing. They knew that the shepherd would provide and care for and protect them and do everything that was necessary to look after those sheep. So what sort of things did the shepherd do for the sheep which resulted in the sheep being completely content? We'll read through the psalm. First of all, he feeds them. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, I'm not an expert on sheep, but I can read books and I can read articles online and learn a little bit. And apparently one of the things that will prevent the sheep from lying down is if it has not been well fed. Until a sheep is satiated, it will stay on its feet and walk around looking for more to eat. But when a sheep has had enough to eat, and if the other conditions, which we look at in a minute, are right, that sheep will happily lie down contentedly on the ground. In the days in which the psalmist lived, and indeed even to this very day in various parts of the Middle East, sheep farmers set out after winter in the spring of the year and they lead their flock on a circuit that will take in the whole year until they come back again at the winter. And the shepherd will lead the flock from one location to another in order to find good grazing ground that the shepherd knows obviously on that circuit is there. And not only that, they not allow the sheep to graze too long in any one place. Because if they do that, 
they'll overgraze that area and so they'll only keep them there maybe a day or two days and then they move on to the next grazing area where that grass is good and so on. The farmer knows that providing good food for the sheep is absolutely essential to the sheep's well-being. He must provide for that sheep. He must feed that sheep. And the sheep in Psalm 23 knew from experience that this shepherd always, always provided for them. Not only did he feed them, he also watered them. He leads me beside still waters. Apparently, good and sufficient food isn't the only thing a sheep needs. It must also have regular access to a good water supply. Sheep are 70% water. Don't know why you knew that or not. The fluid in the sheep maintains normal body metabolism and it determines the vitality and strength and vigor of the sheep. If a sheep doesn't get regular supplies of water, the sheep quickly dehydrates and becomes a sickly animal. The sheep's water supply, in the Middle East, it comes from three main sources. The early morning dew, existing wells from which water can be drawn, and rivers. Now, in order for the sheep to have the early morning dew, it's the shepherd that has to get up before dawn and lead the sheep to the grazing patch where the early morning dew is still there before it evaporates. If the shepherd is going to feed it at a well that he knows is there on his journey, he has to bring the sheep to the well, and then it's the shepherd that has to undertake the hard back-breaking work of bringing the water up out of the well and pouring it out for the sheep. The sheep just stand there. And they're provided for. It's a shepherd that does all the providing. And if the shepherd is bringing them to drink at the side of a river, he will not lead the sheep down to the river's edge. Because the sheep will not drink from a flowing river. The reason being it's afraid. If it goes into the river and if it stumbles, then the sheep will drown. If the sheep goes into the river, its coat will get soaked. The weight of that will pull it down under the water and it will drown. So a sheep usually will never go near a flowing stream. What the shepherd does is he comes down to the river and off to the side he'll dig a hole. And then he will cut a channel from the river to allow the river that is running past to divert into the hole. And the sheep can then drink at the still waters where they're not flowing. He brings me to a place where it's safe to drink. And the point is that it falls to the shepherd to do all of this for the sheep. If a sheep was left to itself, it would probably drink from dirty, polluted water. And that water would be full of parasites and organisms that would harm the sheep. A good shepherd keeps them away from any sources of danger and pollution. The shepherd feeds the sheep. He waters the sheep. Thirdly, he restores the sheep. David says, he restores my soul. Now, of course, we all know what it's like at times to be cast down in our souls. At times when we feel as though everything is getting on top of us and we can't cope. And the psalmist speaks about that in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Why are you cast down, O my soul? In the world of shepherding, there's an old term, maybe it's still used today, where you speak of a sheep being cast or cast down. And it's when a sheep has fallen onto its back and it can't get itself up on its feet again. It lies there with its feet in the air, pathetically kicking and bleeding and calling out for help. Because if no one comes to help, the sheep will end up dying. <laughs> Philip Keller, again in his book, says this. 
A heavy, fat or long fleeced sheep will lie down comfortably in some little hollow or depression in the ground. It may roll on its side slightly to stretch out its legs and relax and then suddenly the centre of gravity in the body shifts so that it turns on its back far enough that the feet no longer are touching the ground. The sheep may feel a sense of panic and start to paw frantically. Frequently, this only makes things worse. It rolls over even further. Now, it is quite impossible for the sheep to gain its feet. As it lies there, gases begin to build up and cut off the blood supply to the extremes of the body and a cast sheep can die in a very few hours. A good shepherd looks out for cast sheep. He listens for the pathetic cry of the sheep bleeding, wanting to be restored. And when a shepherd comes across such a sheep, he restores it. And that's the picture that's there in that psalm. He restores my soul. The shepherd of Psalm 23 fed the sheep, watered the sheep, restored the sheep. He's a good shepherd. But not only that, he guided the sheep or he led the sheep. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Another translation of that is he leads me in right paths. And the idea is that the shepherd goes ahead of the sheep and leads them where he wants them to go. Why? Because he knows the right path that he's taking them on this nine-month journey. If they follow the shepherd, they will be assured that all they need will be met. They will want for absolutely nothing. And for all these reasons, the sheep in this psalm says... I shall not want. I am perfectly content. One of the most beautiful ways in which the New Testament describes the Christian life and the Christian's relationship to Jesus is that of the sheep that belongs to the good shepherd and of the sheep following the shepherd. John 10, from which we read, I am the good shepherd, I know my own sheep, and my own sheep know me. The beautiful picture of the shepherd's sheep relationship in Psalm 23 finds its ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ as the shepherd and in us believers as the sheep. The Christian is able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I belong to him. And because I belong to a good shepherd, to the best shepherd, I'm completely content. This shepherd provides for me. This shepherd goes before me. This shepherd leads me and guides me in life in such a way that I know I can completely depend upon him. As long as I follow closely to the shepherd, he will meet all my needs. And because of that, I'm completely content. How did we belong, come to belong to such a shepherd? Well, we became a sheep of the good shepherd the moment we repented of our sin and trusted in Christ as Savior. To use the analogy of this psalm, we were like a cast sheep lying on our backs with our feet in the air in sin, in the mud and mire of sin. And in that condition, we would have died. All we could do was cry out for help. And when we did, the good shepherd came and he restored our souls. And many people who come to church on the Lord's day and they're like cast sheep They're lying on their backs in sin. And in that condition, 
unless they are put right, they will die. It's very sad being a minister when you do a funeral. And you hear people say of loved ones, loved ones who are not sheep of the good shepherd, who are not Christians, people who probably in life were good, decent people in many ways, but they never trusted in Jesus. There's no time for the shepherd. And you hear people saying, well, they're happy now. They're at peace. Friends, if only they realized what really happens whenever somebody dies who is not part of the flock of the good shepherd. If only they caught a glimpse of the horror into which that individual has gone, they would run like mad to the shepherd. The eye of contentment. Let's move on and look at the second eye of this sheep in Psalm 23. And it's the eye of confidence. You find that in verse 4. Psalmist says, I will fear no evil. So, The psalmist is picturing himself as a sheep belonging to this wonderful shepherd and he's able to say that he has absolutely no fear. He feels completely secure and at ease. And you'll notice that he says this in the context of the valley of the shadow of death. Now that, of course, is the traditional and the most common translation of the Hebrew phrase here. But the Hebrew phrase literally reads the valley of deep darkness. The valley of the shadow of death is a translation, a paraphrase rather than a a literal translation. It reads the valley of deep darkness. Middle Eastern shepherds, whenever they were taking their flocks on this annual circuit and going from one pastoral one grazing spot to another they'd regularly have to lead their flock through narrow deep ravines in between sheer cliff faces on either side of the path and because the cliff faces were so straight up and down and the valley so deep very little light get into that place and if it happened to be in the afternoon or early evening it would have been a very very dark place And it was in such dark places that you would find predators such as mountain lions and jackals which of course are a threat to the sheep. A sheep out on its own in such a place would be terrified and rightly so because it would be in terrible danger. But the sheep in Psalm 23 has no such fears. Why? Because you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The sheep feels completely secure because it knows it's not alone. The shepherd is there with them in the valley of deep darkness. The presence of the shepherd makes all the difference. And it wasn't just the shepherd's presence that the sheep relied on. The sheep also knew the shepherd would protect it from any and every type of of danger. And that's why there's the reference to the shepherd's rod and staff. Now the rod that's referred to there was a piece of wood that was shaped like a club with a round head on it. And in the round head, the shepherd often put pieces of metal or nails And it was used as a means of protecting the shepherd and the sheep from any wild animals or bandits or anything that came along. It's a biblical equivalent of having something like a Kalashnikov around your shoulders. (laughs) A very effective means of protection. The staff, well the staff was a shepherd's wooden stick that he often formed into a crook at the end of it. He would use that stick not only as an aid to himself in walking over rough terrain, but he would use it also to prod the sheep and keep it away from going too near an edge 
of a cliff or keeping it away from going down a track that it shouldn't go down and they used the hook end of it if a young lamb fell into some briars he would get the hook and he'd put it under the neck of the sheep and the, the, the leg and he would lift it up and put it back on the track again so the shepherd's presence his protection his prodding all of these made the sheep feel completely safe as it went through the valley of darkness. All of us go through dark valleys as we follow the shepherd on the journey of life. We talk about life having its highs and its lows. The dark valleys are the lows and some of those valleys are very dark indeed. Valley of sickness, whether it's sickness that you yourself have contracted or someone that you love has been sick, whether that's your spouse or your mum or your dad, your children, grandchildren. The dark valley of that diagnosis that you didn't want to hear of having a serious life debilitating or life changing or maybe even terminal illness. The dark valley of being informed that you're that the child that your wife or maybe your daughter is carrying is going to be born with some serious debilitating health problems. Maybe the dark valley of learning that your business is in serious financial trouble and that closure is a very real possibility. The dark valley of losing your job and all the financial and practical implications of that for life. The dark valley of being, in these days, scammed out of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of pounds by fraudsters. The dark valley of coping with someone in your family having committed suicide. The dark valley of living with depression. The dark valley of bereavement. The loss of one who was dearly loved and who is sorely missed. And then of course the dark valley of you personally approaching what for you is the valley of the shadow of death what is our comfort what is our confidence what is our assurance in those dark valleys of life well for the christian it is knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt that the lord jesus christ our good shepherd is with us in that valley that he'll watch over us that he'll protect us that he'll guide us that he'll lead us we're not in the valley alone Yes, the valley is a fearful place, but the presence of the Good Shepherd brings light into the darkness and comfort into the troubled heart. That natural panic, that natural fear, those natural misgivings and dread, they dissolve away and they give way to a quiet, calm and confidence because there's one there who's beside us. Even though I am walking through the darkest valley, I will not fear any evil because you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's only the sheep who belongs to the good shepherd who can say that. It's only the true believer who has such comfort and confidence even in the darkest valleys, and some of you have proven that. So the eye of contentment, the eye of confidence, and lastly, the eye of destiny, or if you want another C, the eye of conclusion. You find the third eye in the last verse. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That verse, of course, is very familiar to us and we immediately associate it with going to be with God in heaven and there's no doubt that that is indeed how we're meant to apply it. But before we come to that, you need to first of all understand it from the perspective of the sheep in this psalm. That's the way it was originally written. What's the sheep saying? Well, the psalm begins with the Middle Eastern shepherd leading his flock away from the security of the home farm in the spring of the year. And he's going to take them on a journey that will last basically 
nine months. The shepherd goes ahead of them. He shows them the way. He leads them. He knows where he's taking them, even if the sheep don't know where the shepherd is going. But as they follow the shepherd, he feeds them. He waters them. He protects them. He provides for them. They enjoy all that they as sheep will ever need. The shepherd ensures that no harm will come to them. That's the idea of goodness and mercy following them all the days of their journey. The journey isn't easy as a sheep. You're going to go into valleys. You're going to face dangers and difficulties. But the sheep's confidence is that the shepherd in whom the sheep is completely trusting is there ahead of them and with them. And now, having taken them on that nine-month journey, he's brought them safely to the end of that journey. And the sheep are heading home, back to the farm for the long winter. They're going to stay in the house of their Lord, their master, their shepherd. For the sheep, it's a coming home. For the sheep, it's the end of that journey. The dark valleys are behind them. The struggling over the rough mountain terrain is over. There aren't any more dangerous, hungry predators to watch out for. Now they have peace and calm serenity in the Lord's house. (coughs) Now do you see the imagery? The imagery of the sheep gives way to the reality of the saint. Goodness and mercy follow us every step of life's journey. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One day, that journey, whatever length of time it takes, through whatever dangers and dark valleys and difficult terrain our pathway takes us, that journey one day will come to its end. There'll not be any more dangers or hardships or difficulties. Sickness and sorrow and pain, it'll all be over. And having walked with us through the valley of the shadow, the good shepherd leads us to the peace and joy and delight of his house. And that, of course, is heaven. And in the house of the Lord, well, there's complete contentment. There's no more fear. And we've reached our destiny. I saw new heavens and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Death will be no more. There won't be any more mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away. Of course, these words are only true of those who can say, The Lord is my shepherd. Martin Luther said the sum and substance of Psalm 23 is summed up in personal pronouns. And the first personal pronoun is my shepherd. If the Lord is your shepherd, then folks, what a wonderful journey. We're on with the shepherd leading us every step of life's journey. And we can say, I'm completely content. There's nothing that I fear. And I know where I'm going. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen. We should sing Psalm 23, I suppose, but we're going to sing Psalm 32. (laughs) 
Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, and 5 and 6. Of course, unless we have our sins forgiven, we're not a shepherd, a sheep belonging to the good shepherd. This psalm speaks about the blessedness of the person who has come to know that forgiveness. How blessed is the man to whom has freely pardoned been all the transgressions he has done and covered as a sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit is not found deceit or treachery. How does a person experience that forgiveness? How does one become a sheep of the shepherd? I have confessed to you. I have acknowledged all my sin. And likewise, my iniquity I have not hid within. I to the Lord will now confess my trespasses, said I, and of my sin you did forgive all the iniquity. Let's sing this to the praise of God, to the tune Wallace 172, as we bring our evening worship to a close. And now depart with the blessing of God. May grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one true and living God, be with each of you the flock of God. This night, throughout the rest of life's journey, and then forevermore. Amen.